Hey. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I... I have nothing to be sorry for, okay? This is Chelsea Nebby. Welcome to MDPHD and Me. I have no idea how the intro usually goes, but today we're gonna talk about my Q3 quarterly reflections. Stay tuned. All right, so yeah, I really, I really cannot even remember. I think my intro is usually like, hi, my name is Chelsea Nebby, and today we're gonna talk about <laughs> wow okay whatever so yeah so q3 is over it kind of ended so i don't know when this is going to be released because it is what it is right now it is july 12th and q3 ended june 9th so <laughs> so i took my sweet time in making this video and i guess i'm glad i did i don't know i think i should have done it sooner but you know life happens life happens and it continues to happen to us all so yeah q3 is done i passed everything grateful you know what i'm saying hashtag grateful hashtag didn't see it coming hashtag you know we own the school you know what i'm saying <laughs> Okay, anyway, I guess, let me just get into my notes because I think it's so weird to look back at the notes that I've been taking over the course of the quarter. I can't always remember what state of mind I was in when I took the notes. Sometimes I can, but I think I'm in a much different place now and I think that's for the best. So let's just get into it. So one of the first things I wrote, actually, sorry, before I, before I really start talking about everything, we finally began the block system. So I basically had two classes that were classes of classes. We had the practice of medicine, AKA POM, which I've had since Q1, if you've been following along. POM, this, this time around POM wasn't, POM wasn't really a class of classes like it used to be. It really was like two parts. Every Monday we had clinical reasoning. So we would show up in small groups and kind of just kind of work through cases and practice how we should be thinking about cases when they present to us. And then on Fridays, we were just exposed to like different patient populations and different, different scenarios, not scenarios, but different, how would I say? I don't know, like different situations, like how to deal with a family, how to deal with, you know, kids, you know, for pediatrics, how to deal with patients in the hospital, what's, what that's like. So we got to go to the hospital, geriatric patients. It was just like a real grab bag of like a lot of random stuff. We did a psych thing. I liked psych more than I, more than I am comfortable with liking psych. I really liked psych. I was like, I don't want to be a psychiatrist. I really want to be some kind of surgeon, but like, I really liked psych. So if I end up being a psychiatrist, I, I, I'll just say I'm not surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if I ended up being a psychiatrist. So that was POM. And then for SOM School of Medicine, we finally started like the block system. I don't really know how it works in other schools, but I assume this is kind of what it's like. So for SOM, we had like two blocks. Yeah, two blocks and then two threads. The blocks were cardio and pulmonary stuff, cardiology and pulmonary, pulmonology. And then the threads were pharmacology and pathology. Pathology really just blended into the blocks because like when we would have a class that was supposed to fall under like the cardio block or the palm block, it was teaching us like the fundamentals of how things are supposed to work. But then when we would have the pathology thread, it would still be teaching us that subject, but more like, you know, how things how things are when things go poorly. And we had like a lot of slides, you know, that we had to look at and we'd have to be able to like know what's going on in the slides, <laughs> which is not easy. And then with farm, we didn't have a lot of pharmacology this time around. I think we're gonna get more pharmacology next quarter, but it was just like a lot of, we learned a lot about how drugs work in the body. Like, I don't wanna say it was like common sense stuff because. I don't think it's always like common sense, but it was, to me, it was like very easy, very like basic math, you know what I mean? <laughs> Which I liked, but there were also some concepts that are not immediately intuitive, but I, I think are still kind of interesting. So yeah, that was, those are the classes. I, I don't really have a lot to say about the classes themselves. Maybe when I get into my notes, I'll end up talking more about like the different classes, but yeah, let's just, let's just dive into it. Here's my first note. I feel weird because I feel like aggressive perfectionism is what got me to where I am. And now I'm asked to not depend on it. So it 
doesn't drive me crazy. The difference between needing to know everything and get everything done and not being able to know everything these days and get everything done. Yeah, so I know I'm not the only one who feels this way. And I'm not saying everyone who gets into med school or even everyone who gets into like a top tier med school is a perfectionist, but I think a lot of us are. And you know, like a lot of us were the best in our class. A lot of us were the ones who like, were really trying to get A's and we got the A's and we also got like fellowships and we also got like other things, you know? Especially if you're MD, PhD, actually to me, I, for some reason, I feel like it's less so if you're MD-PhD, I could be wrong. But I, yeah, I don't know, a lot of the MD-PhDs that I know, like they, they are just as perfectionistic, perfectionistic, or I guess they have just as impressive of a resume as like the other students, the other MDs. But I can say for me, and I talk to other students, they agree. I can say for me, being, I don't want to say being the best, hmm being the best and more so getting perfect grades is what I felt I needed to do to get into a top tier medical school, a top tier MSTP program, which is what I wanted. I hate when I say MSTP program because the P is program, but <laughs> a top tier MSTP. That's what I felt I needed to do. And I think that is what I needed to do to get into a place like Stanford. I don't think they would take me if I had like B's and C's and like a 502 MCAT. I don't think they would take me unless I was a research prodigy but even still, I don't think they would really take me like that. Cause you just have to show that you're ready for med school. And then when you get to med school, you know, there's, they constantly tell you like, girl, like chill out, like it's pass fail, like don't be a perfectionist. You're not gonna get all A's. And I'm like, <sighs> like <laughs> it stresses me out. It stresses me out. And it's, maybe I talk about this later. Yeah, I think I'm going to talk about this later, but there's different kinds of stressful when you're in medical school, at least for me. And I, I don't think everyone feels this way, but I know I'm not the only one who feels this way. Getting like a 75. <laughs> And it, honestly, it's not the 75, really. It's going into the test and and seeing a lot of questions that I'm not confident on. Like one or two questions, okay, fine. You know what I mean? They got away from me. The one that got away, Katy Perry. But it's like 10 questions, <laughs> like 10 questions in a 60 question test. Like that's a lot. That feels like a lot because I'm thinking if I wasn't sure about 10 questions and I was like kind of confident on like 15, I'm pretty sure that the ones I was kind of confident on, I probably got half of those wrong so that's like 17 questions I didn't get like that's that's a lot like that feels like a lot you know and I'm not always thinking this way but in a way because we were learning about like heart failure and like myocardial infarctions which are, is basically a heart attack because it's so funny like we never use the terminology heart attack <laughs> and I thought that was like a legit like diagnosis <laughs> but we were learning about serious issues and they would like give us like real scenarios and so it's kind of like when you don't get it right you're like oh man the patient did the patient just die on me because i made the wrong call like i don't know and to be honest i don't really feel that way because it's just a test but I, I i do i think really what got to me was feeling like i'm so used to knowing all the answers on a test, like I'm really used to that. And now I'm in a place where I go into the test. Here's the other thing, I study really hard, <laughs> like really, 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 really hard for this test. And then I go in and I, I like barely know what's going on. That's what gets me. Cause I'm like, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? I, I tried so hard. I tried so hard and like Stanford kind of grades like on a weirdish kind of curve and it's not really a curve but it's I don't I don't really understand how it works but they kind of were graded and then they'll see how we do and if they think a curve is necessary they'll give us one but it's not necessarily like everyone needs like somebody needs to fail every time we give an assessment that's not how they do it but I don't really understand how they do it all I know all I know is that Stanford, and let me know if, if, if your school does this too, Stanford tends to release your grade and the class average, as well as like the standard deviation and the median. When I tell you, when I tell you, that to me is the most stressful part. And I hate admitting it because I like, you know, I, for me, I, let me be honest with y'all. I tend to fall below the class average. I've been passing and I, I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I have not failed a major assessment 
I failed a couple, like one or two quizzes, whatever. I have not failed a major assessment. I passed SOM at least Q3 the first time. I passed Q2. Q1 is a different story. Um, but I, I mean, I technically passed all those classes as well the first time, except for biochem, but that's whatever, whatever. Okay, a lot was going on. I knew I wasn't gonna pass that one, I told them. But I passed and I, and I try not to take that for granted because I know there are students who don't pass. And I don't know how crushing that might be, especially for someone like me who is fragile, okay? <laughs> like fragile. <laughs> but I passed, but seeing that I'm like every time, like I was, I was, I've been consistently below average and one or two times I've been like slightly above average. Like I'm talking like the average was like a 70, 78 and I got like a 78.5 or a 79. <laughs> And I'm just, but then like the standard deviation will be like five points. And I'm like, who is scoring so high? Like, who, who like, and then I'd have to have like real conversations with myself. Like Chelsea, do you need to be the best? Like, is your ego that big? Are you so insecure that you need to be the best in your class? And I honestly don't think I need to be the absolute best. Like, I don't think I need to be within like, I don't know, the 98th percentile of my class, but I want to be above average I uh, consistently. I either like, I want to be above average. I'm not gonna lie. Like, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. And that was really hard. And I'm still struggling with it. I'm not gonna lie. Like transparency is really important to me because I, I don't want you guys to like potentially go through the same thing and feel alone or feel like something's wrong with you. Um, and I did have a friend who kind of felt like, I feel like you're being, they told me like, I feel like you're being hard on yourself because <laughs> you know, this is med school. It's really hard. You are at Stanford. So like you literally are competing quote unquote with the cream of the crop or comparing yourself to the cream of the crop of the country. And you're not like even that far below, like you're not even failing. Like, you're not <laughs> and I'm like, I know. <laughs> Oh, but still like, oh, I might link a video that I saw a while ago. I want to say ASAP Science came out with it. And it was basically talking about like the, the effects of being like a big fish in a small pond versus a, a regular fish or even a big fish in a in an ocean. And it's real. It's real. And I don't know, I, I could talk more about it, but let me just say that I think there were a lot of factors involved because for example, when I was in the prior quarters, I think the prior quarters were like a bit easier. So when I was taking genetics, when I was taking immuno, I genuinely did not care how the rest of the class scored because I felt like I did so well personally. I went into those tests. I knew what was going on. I, I really did not care how the rest of the class was doing. But now that I'm coming into tests and I don't feel confident when I leave the test, and, and I think if I went into the test and I didn't feel confident, but my score was at least above average, I would feel better. I think if I went into the test and I was confident and I, I was, a, I really appreciated my performance, but then I get my grade back and I was like below average or maybe just close to average, I think I would feel better than I do now. But I'm in a situation where I go in, I take the test, I don't leave confident, and then I end up being below average anyway. Like it's just... <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> okay, so, and that's gonna come back when I talk about the midterm, but I just wanna get through these notes cause like, I have a lot to say. So here's a little, here's a little saltiness coming through for this quarter. I, f I kind of feel like I, I had to make my own curriculum. I don't wanna talk to Mac about Stanford, okay? I really don't because I'm gonna be here for eight years, but I don't even think this is, I think this is partly a Stanford problem. And then this is also partly a nationwide problem from what I've heard, I could be wrong. And I think some schools are probably doing better than others. But like, for example, when I talk to the students at Northwestern, they personally, like I've, from what I've gathered, they felt taken care of in terms of like how the curriculum and the program was structured. Same with WashU. 
at St. Louis. When I talked to the students at Stanford, they didn't necessarily feel that way. Now, I'm not saying that's a reason to not come to Stanford. There are other bonuses to coming to Stanford. It's not like the end of the world, but it's something to consider. Like, I don't know. Here's what I'm gonna say, right? The first two quarters of classes, in my opinion, were very well structured. I have to give shout outs to genetics and immuno because I felt like I was learning. I felt like I knew what I had to do to get a good grade and really get a grasp on the material and I did it and the grades came through. Again, I don't I don't think I was the top of my class. Like I think in those classes, the mean and the median were like close to a 95 and I think I got like a 93. So like I was fine. Like I really didn't care too much, but for some, here's here's where things fell apart. They just didn't want to make a syllabus. They didn't want to make a syllabus because like we're we're being taught by like a lot of different people, which is something that happens across the country. You have a lot of pe different people teaching different niche topics within the block. And that's a common complaint across the country. I, I didn't mind that so much because I tended to not rely so much, like in my past, I haven't really relied so much on the lecture. I've always relied on the reading material. There was always a textbook that the teacher taught from. So I just felt like, let me just read the textbook and move on with my life. And it always worked. Again, in genetics and immuno, we had a solid textbook, uh, sorry, a solid syllabus that you could read from. And oftentimes the syllabus had more than you needed to know. And I appreciated that. It was a good read. I liked it. And also I knew every day, like I had to get this many pages done and I would be good. But Sam didn't have a syllabus. So a lot of people were relying on Boards and Beyond, which is a step one like prep material, has a lot of videos. And mind you, Stanford is more or less clear on the fact that they don't teach according to step one. They teach us what they feel like we need to know. And I'm not gonna lie, I don't really have a problem with that. Maybe I'll get like more frustrated about that when I actually have to study for step one and it's like a whole different ball game and I feel like I'm starting from scratch. But I, if like I trust my professors to teach me what they think I need to know to become a great doctor and I wanna become a great doctor. I didn't go to Stanford for nothing. You know what I'm saying? So. I trust my professors. I just feel like if you're gonna go like way off course, or let, let me let me go back. The thing is, they didn't really, I felt like there wasn't a lot of structure. Let me just say that. I felt like there wasn't a lot of structure to the classes because there was no syllabus and because there was no like textbook. So I felt like I had to piece together like Boards and Beyonds videos to teach myself the, the course material. And it wasn't, it, it it held me through. I ended up changing my strategy later on. It held me through, but I also ended up learning a lot of extraneous information through Boards and Beyond than was necessary. And I and that was kind of frustrating. And I, I talked to a lot of my friends and they also felt really like confused as to how to study for SOM. I mean, we were given like reading materials, like required reading. <laughs> It was literally like 30 pages per lecture. And we and we had like three lectures a day, four days a week. I know I'm a slow reader. I know I'm a slow reader, but that was unacceptable. And like everybody knew it. <laughs> oh my goodness. And, and oftentimes it was from like a million different books. I don't know, I don't know. Like I hate to complain about Stanford because I feel like, girl, you didn't have to come here. You had a choice and you chose this institution. Be grateful. And I am, I really am grateful. Like I, I really feel like Stanford has treated me well. I, I, I'm never going to not say that. I feel like Stanford has treated me well, at least the administration, but Sam was a mess. Okay, Sam was a mess. Sam was a mess, okay? And at one point, one of the directors was like, we're, we're trying to get you to think critically. And I literally think that when she said that, she kind of meant she's, we're tr she's trying to get us to learn how to scavenge for information, basically, and not just rely on a textbook. Like, <laughs> what can I say? Like, what can I say? Yeah, so I kind of switched my strategy later on in the, in the, quarter. And I think I talk about that, but 
Yeah, here's my next note. I started to abandon reading only as my learning style because I realized that re research says that specific learning styles for every person aren't real. Now, if you watch my Q2 video, you'll know that I was reading a book called Managing Myself by the Harvard Business Review and they basically said you need to uh, figure out whether you are a reader, if you're somebody who learns by reading or by talking. I still kind of think that's true, but it's not that you can only read to learn. For example, you can read a textbook, you could read a PowerPoint slide, you could read a transcript of a lecture. Alternatively, you could listen to a lecture, you could listen to an audiobook, you can, I, I guess you can't really listen to a PowerPoint slide, but you can watch videos of different things. You can, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can learn. And ultimately the best way to learn, I, I think is like using different modalities to learn. I have tea and I'm like, I wanna drink it, but let me just wait. So yeah, I started to abandon reading only. And the reason why I'm saying this is because if you feel like you're someone who only learns through videos or only learns through lectures, make sure that you're not limiting yourself to what you're comfortable with because your school may not cater to you in that way. Like if you only learn through lectures, you might end up having some people who like don't teach well through lectures, yet your school offers a really great syllabus. If you only learn through reading, you might end up at a school that doesn't make a syllabus. <laughs> and so you have to learn through lectures or through videos. And I, yeah, I had to pivot because the reading materials I was trying to read, they weren't really working out for me. Some were, some weren't, most weren't, I think. And so I decided to just take notes from the lecture as best I can and understand that I wasn't gonna get everything. And that, that kind of worked. I think it saved me time. That's why I appreciated it. And I wanted to spend way more time on Anki, you know, cause Anki is gold. Anki is gold. Yeah, I said, it's, uh, the next note says, it's much better to utilize active recall, practice problems sooner than later, and whatever mode of learning helps you learn the specific t material best. Yeah, like, yeah, so that's that's one of the reasons why thinking you only learn in one way doesn't work because you're not gonna read to learn anatomy, right? And I'm a reading kind of person, but most people would argue anatomy is a visual slash haptic kind of haptic is when you learn through like using your hands and, and doing things. And in anatomy, you you dissect the, the cadaver and you visually look at the body. So I think it's a bit of visual, a bit of haptic, and most people would not recommend reading to learn anatomy. With cardio and palm, like, okay, for pharmacology, I personally like reading for farm, but it's not the same kind of reading you would do for cardio. I, I just like to read to get the concept, but ultimately the thing that will teach you pharmacology is doing a lot of practice problems and also just memorizing the medications. For cardio and palm, I think a syllabus could be made. I, I think that those subjects would be best taught through reading. But I, I can admit that like you can also learn quite a bit through lectures, which I guess is like audio. So yeah. I've also found that informative videos have been helpful, like Boards and Beyond. Cause I, I would have thought before that I wouldn't like Boards and Beyond cause I'm a reader, but Boards and Beyond is actually like a lot of text on PowerPoint. So I just read the text and it was really helpful. So yeah, let's move on. Oh my goodness. So let's talk about the midterm. Let's talk about the midterm. Because of COVID, the midterm, I, maybe they used to do this in other years. I, I could be wrong. But the way we did the midterm and basically every major assessment was we had a short, uh, sorry, it's not a short answer, an open, uh, is it a long answer? I think it's called short answer. Yeah, short answer, open book test. That's like part one of the test. And we got to do this from home. And we had specific software. Actually, wait, was it open? Yeah, it was open book, so we didn't need the software. But we basically had like a couple of questions and we had to answer it. It was open book, it was timed. And yeah, so that was part one. Then we had to go in person to school and do part two where it was multiple choice and also timed. So for the midterm, which was the first major assessment of the quarter, we only had two, well, we had we had like uh we had the midterm which was mid quarter and at the end of the quarter we had 
a test for cardio, we had a test for palm, and then we had like an integrated test for like everything. So the midterm was the first major assessment of the quarter and I took the first open-ended and I was really frustrated by how much I relied on the internet. And seeing how much things have changed from like 2018 to 2019, I guess I wasn't here for a lot of 2019, but from 2018 to 2020, they really allowed us to do a lot more open book in 2020 because we were all at home. And they kind of felt like, I, this is what I've heard through the grapevine. They felt like if we're going to have people take exams at home, they have to be open book because essentially they can't, a, they can't rely on us students honoring the honor code. And if one or two people or a group of people end up cheating because they're at home and they can go on the internet using their phone to answer the questions, that will essentially ruin the curve for everybody else. So because of that, they just don't even want people to be tempted and they're just going to have everyone have access to open book for, or, or, yeah, have everyone have access to the internet, but we can't collaborate, which I'm like, we could still collaborate if we really wanted to be shady, but like, uh, we're not supposed to collaborate, but we had access to open book so that nobody would be tempted to cheat. <laughs> yeah, so I kind of felt like when things are not open book, you really have to know your stuff. Sometimes some subjects are open book and you don't really even use it. That's what I've seen. Like in, in the past when I've had open book exams, you don't really use your book. That's, I mean, I really have never had to use my notes when I've had open book exams. I've never really had an open internet exam, but for the most part, when I've been given open book exams, I just, I've never really needed to use it. But ever since things have been open book here at Stanford, like I I feel like I've been relying heavily on the internet, sometimes just to check my work, but sometimes to get me through that exam. And it really frustrated me because I just felt like things were being made easier for us because of COVID. But I don't know, the, the results of our exam showed that we've been scoring very similarly to like previous years. So maybe me, that's just me worrying for no reason. But when I took the open book exam, I really didn't feel like I scored very well. There was one question that I really just couldn't answer at all. And I felt bad because I'm like, you had the whole internet, you couldn't answer the question. I thought I knew the answer, but I was like, no, it's too obvious. It's too obvious. It might've been the answer. I don't know to this day, but I really, I felt like I relied heavily on the internet for the other parts of the, for the exam. So I didn't go into the multiple choice in-person exam feeling very confident. And I ended up like, so, okay. So I did the multiple choice. I left crushed, like feeling like, oh, I'm a poor medical student. I'll never make it through med school. I'm a failure. I'm a flop. That's honestly how I felt. And when the results came out, I felt pretty stupid because I actually did decently well on the midterm above average. That was one of the few times I was above average for the multiple choice part. For the open-ended, like I scored below average. Yeah. But yeah, it was, it was interesting to to have had such a meltdown over an exam and to not have done that poorly. Weird feeling. But I did some course correcting. I felt like Boards and Beyond had too much extraneous information. I didn't want to spend too much time on it. And I, I kept thinking of like all the like videos I've watched that are like, you have to be like adaptable in med school. You have to be flexible. So I was like, okay, you know what? Let's, let's, Let's throw away boards and beyond, throw away the textbooks that have not been serving me, and <laughs> let's just rely more on lecture because I think they really are teaching to the lecture. Surprise, surprise. And, or more so testing according to what's taught in lecture. And I think that helped, I can't really tell. <laughs> I can't really tell. And I wanted to spend more time doing Anki. I was doing like an hour a day, but I wanted to do more. And one thing that I did that I thought was really, really helpful was I would, there were two things. Prior to the midterm, I would take a walk, a one hour walk. Yes, it was one hour. It was 30 minutes out, 30 minutes back. And I would just do Anki. I would not take my headphones, so I would not be tempted to do something else. I would just do Anki, get that sunshine, walk. So that gave me like an hour of Anki. And after the midterm, I was like, you know what? What if I just did like 10 minutes of Anki every hour? Just every hour at some point throughout the hour, usually at the top of the hour, just pause, do 10 minutes of Anki and let that be that. That 
literally doubled the amount of Anki I did within a day. And it didn't really feel like work. And you know, sometimes I would be doing the Anki and I'd feel like I'm in a, I'm in a, what's it called? In a groove, I think that's what they, say i'm like you know in in the zone and i'll like do 15 minutes or 20 minutes it was really cool so yeah but i i definitely felt like i needed to course correct after the midterm because i just felt like i want to do better i want to be above average you know or at least i want to score within the 80s because it's like part of me wanted to be above average for my ego not that i wanted you know, to, I really like my peers, right? It's not that I wanted to be on top of my peers, but I wanted to be above average. Like those seem like two different things to me in my head, even though that's basically the same thing. But I guess I, I felt like I wanted to be on par with my peers. I don't know. So one half of me wanted to be above average. The other half of me wanted to at least feel confident about the way I was taking tests and feel confident about answering the questions. And I felt like, okay, that sounds like scoring within the 80 range. Like maybe if I started scoring within the 80 range, I would feel better. Yeah, that hasn't happened. So <laughs> has it happened? I actually can't even remember some of the grades I got. I just know I passed. So I was like, that's all I need to know. That's all I need to know. <laughs> Uh, I actually have friends who like don't don't check their scores because the way it works, at least at Stanford, is that you'll be notified if you failed or got close to failing. So if you're not notified, then you pass. So I have friends who just don't check their grades, which I'm like, you're so strong. <laughs> yeah, so I started taking notes during class and reviewing the notes after class. Okay, so let's talk about something else that really hit me hard this quarter. Imposter syndrome has been very real, very real, but I also just feel like it's a waste of time. I talked about this in my, in my Motivation Monday video about imposter syndrome. It really just felt like a waste of time. I spent, yes, let me read this next note. I have had several days of feeling like I'm not smart enough to be here and it was a mistake to admit me, but I'm here now and feeling bad for myself is just taking time and energy away from me, pushing myself to be better and or attending to self-care as needed. I really cannot explain how poorly I felt specifically in Q3. I think in Q2, there were some times when I felt like, oh, this is hard, this is hard, but I'm pushing through. Oh, this is hard, am I gonna make it? Q3, I was like, I don't wanna be a doctor anymore. Like I, <laughs> like Q3, I was like, how did I get in here? How did I get in here? Like, what am I doing? Like, did I make a mistake? Oh, Q3, I really, I really did not feel good enough to be here. And I feel bad at my, at my past self feeling that way, but it just, I think it was, I think it had a lot to do with like scoring below average, but I don't know. I just felt like it wasn't just that. It wasn't just that. It was also not being prepared when people would ask me questions about things we were supposed to have things we were already taught. And sometimes that would just be because I was behind on the material. Like I don't go to class in real time. So sometimes we would have like a lecture at eight and they would ask me something at 10 a.m. that we learned at 8 a.m. And I'm like, I was actually gonna review that at one. Like, you know, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But a lot of times my peers really knew what was going on, or at least it felt that way. And it was just hard. It was, it was hard and it, it really eroded my self-esteem. And I don't know, I, I really struggled. I really struggled with feeling like I wasn't good enough to be here. But at some point I was like, girl, are you going to leave? Like, <laughs> are you going to leave? I really had to ask myself, I was like, are you going to leave? Yes or no? Because if you leave, I promise you, they won't let you back. I I promise you. I promise you that will be the end if you leave, you know? I don't know, it was really hard. And I just felt like, well, I don't think I'm gonna leave. I don't think I'm gonna leave. So I just have to make the most of this, girl. <laughs> I really do. I just have to make the most of this and and really, really just figure out why I'm here. And that's something that I've been thinking about more, especially in the last few days. And I'll talk about this in my Q5 reflections, which is the summer quarter. Wait, hold on. Q4 reflections, which is the summer quarter. I've, I mean, I'll, ex I'll explain it. I don't want to give away too much, but I've really had to think about like, why am I here? Like, why am I a doctor? Why am I a researcher? Honestly, research brings a spark back, but like, why am I doing all this? Why? Life potentially could be much better if I did something else. Potentially, we don't know. And part of me was like, you know, is it that I have to 
go through the hardship to get to the sweet part where I'm a doctor doing the thing? Or is it just gonna be hard from here on out? Like, is the paperwork just going to pile up? Like, I, I don't know. But yeah, I did a lot of rethinking my decision to be a doctor. And I actually got to this point. Y'all are gonna be surprised and sad, okay? Get a Kleenex, okay? Because I, I, I kind of, I'm not really dead set on being a neurosurgeon anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I know like so many people are gonna be like, I told you so, I told you so. And I don't know, part of me is like, I feel like low key, I feel like I'm still gonna end up being a neurosurgeon. But I just got to a point where I was like, why am I putting myself through so much stress? Q3 was stressful, stressful. And my, my one of the directors was like, you know, give up that perfectionism because it's going to like really make things harder. And I think it was hard for me to give up the perfectionism mentality, but I just kind of felt like Q3 was really wearing me out. Because I, I think when I really think about it, I didn't have a reason to be stressed out about Q3. I mean, I did, but I didn't. You know, I, I thought I failed the midterm, but you know, fine. But then I realized that I passed. So, and I hadn't really been doing that badly on the quizzes. So I don't know. I don't know if I really had a reason to think I was gonna fail. In fact, I don't ever think I thought I was gonna fail. I don't ever think I thought I was gonna fail. Wait, hold on. Does that make I don't ever think I thought, yes. I don't think I, <laughs> sorry, that's a hard, Sorry, sentence. But I never felt like I was going to fail. I just felt like I wouldn't do as well as I should. And I felt like I wasn't doing as well as my peers. And that's what was bringing me down. So I think I made it more stressful for myself than I needed to. But I, I really got to a point where I just thought about how stressful it was just to be a medical student and everybody knows how stressful neurosurgery residency is. It's not a game, you know? And I was like, do I wanna do that to myself? Really, like really, like <laughs> don't I deserve a break? Like <laughs> don't I deserve a break? Don't, do I really wanna be a neurosurgeon? Like for real, for real, do I really wanna be a neurosurgeon? And I think that for a long time, I had been ignoring the reality of the fact that you make some serious lifestyle sacrifices when you're a neurosurgeon. It just is what it is. I, I kept clinging on to exceptions and feeling like, well, I can buck the trend. I could do this, I could do that. But do I really wanna risk it? Like <laughs> Honestly. And then I started thinking about like, you know, what's because one thing that a lot of neurosurgery residents will tell you is they literally say, if you could see yourself doing anything else, go do it. I'm like, why would you say that? That's why would you say that? But I got to a point where I was like, all right, what else can I do? What else can I do? And I was thinking about how I really like ob -GYN, And I genuinely like ob -GYN. I like the idea of working with pregnant people. I like, the, I, I don't really get to work with babies, but I, I do like the idea of pregnancy and also like, you know, sexual health health or just women's health. I, I really like all of it. And at least being an obstetrician, you get a little bit of surgery with the childbirth. But then I found out that the ob residency is also really hard. So I was like, why, why can't I win? Why can't, what? <laughs> I think the only uh, residency slash specialty that I'm interested in that doesn't have a reputation of being really hard as psychiatry. I, I just don't want to be a psychiatrist. I, I don't know why. I don't know why. I think I would make a really good psychiatrist too. <laughs> I don't know why. I think for me, I really just like working with my hands. So I don't want to give that up. But I really like the research opportunities that are in psychiatry. I really, really like it. And I'm not as excited about the research opportunities in ob -GYN, but I think that there's more than I realize. And I'm always excited about neurosurgery. So I don't know. I just had to give myself that grace. I was like, girl, regardless of how badly you want to drill into somebody's skull, give yourself the grace to bow out of a neurosurgery residency if you don't want to be stressed out for eight years, eight plus years. I don't even know if it really gets better after residency, but like give yourself the grace. Because part of me also felt like I was just telling people I wanted to be a neurosurgeon because I had been saying it for so long. I'm not gonna lie, all throughout undergrad, I had that fire in my belly. Like I was like, I will be a neurosurgeon. It's not about what I wanna do. I will be a neurosurgeon. Like I will accomplish certain things in my life. Neurosurgery is one of them. And since I've been here, again, I'm not blaming Stanford. I'm really not. I. This could have happened at any medical school. But since I've been here, I've just been like, I just want to make it. Like, <laughs> I just want to graduate. 
I just want to come out of here alive. I've really been doubting my ability to be a neurosurgeon and just to be great. Like I've, I've always felt like I've wanted to be great. Like it always, I don't know why, but I always felt like I needed to be. And you know, maybe that's a whole other thing to unpack on its own, but I've always wanted to be great. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that could probably fuel a lot of great things, who knows? And I've had to really redefine what I see as greatness. Like maybe greatness is not external validation. Maybe greatness can be defined in other ways. But since I've been here, I really haven't felt like I could be great. And things that has been changing, thankfully. I've, that's been lifted. I think to be honest, cause I've had to really come to terms with the fact that like, one of the big reasons why I got into medicine is because, or I'll say why I wanted to be a doctor, why I wanted to go into medicine, be a pre-med was because I was good at it. <laughs> I was good at it. You know, doors were opening for me in the field and I just felt like, well, feels like a cakewalk, let's just do it, you know? But now, and then I, you know, I also loved, you know, helping patients and the research, like, I'm not gonna lie, I love that too. But like, I really went into it because I was good at it. And now I don't really feel like I'm good at it anymore. And now it just doesn't come easy anymore. And I'm, I'm really being challenged for the, <laughs> like I'm being challenged for the first time in my life. And I don't really feel like I'm rising, you know? But then I had to like, take a step back and I don't know, just like rise, but not put pressure on myself to rise. Like, I don't know if that makes sense. I feel like by, by removing the pressure to rise and remembering what I'm doing this for, what I need to do versus, you know, what I think I want to do for the validation of other people, things like that. Like I actually felt like I started doing better as a result. Let me, let me go back to my notes. I think I have a bit more to say. Yeah, so one really cool thing that happened the day of my final, the last final, the integrated final, was I actually, when I took the test, I felt like I failed. I felt like I failed. And then I walked out and I saw some of my friends and you all know how it is like when you just take a test and then you see some friends outside the class and then like you start talking about how you think you did and like what the certain answers were. <laughs> so I started talking to a lot of my friends about what I felt certain answers were. And we all, we all had the same answers and we were all unsure about the same questions. And I was like, yo, yo. Like, it was so crazy because I left feeling like I failed and I ended up like after talking to my friends I ended up feeling really good about my performance and feeling like everything's gonna be every little thing gonna be all right that's literally how I felt yeah it just felt really good so yeah those are all my notes I know I've been all over the place I can't believe it's been an hour but here's what here's what I want to close with because I, I that was like just really all over the place here's what I want to close with I think one thing that really was a big theme for me this quarter was feeling like I couldn't be great now I'm not gonna lie since I had hiccups like since 2018, when I started having hiccups, even a little bit before I started having hiccups, I really stopped believing that I could be a neurosurgeon. And the the crazy part about it was like, it's not that I didn't think I could get into a neurosurgery residency. I knew I could. I had the PhD or I would have the PhD. Everything's turning into pass fails and nobody would even know how I did on these like you know, on step one and all these different things. I knew I could get into a residency, but I didn't think I had what it took to be a neurosurgeon. I just felt like a joke, I'm not gonna lie. And it that really, that feeling just kind of intensified in Q3. I felt like I couldn't be great. I felt like, you know, I just, I don't know, I, I, I had no fire, like I had no fire. And I just, I, I think the really, the best way to say it is that I felt like I couldn't be great. And I don't wanna say that I needed to feel that way cause I don't think anyone needs to feel that way. But I think really what it is, is that I've never been challenged and I've never had to figure out what coping mechanisms I need to employ when I feel challenged. I've never had to figure out how to take care of myself, I guess, when I when I feel challenged and I don't feel like I rose to the occasion. With all that being said, I feel like I'm, I'm in a place now where I still feel like I can be great. I feel like I can accomplish great things. I feel like I can do what whatever it is I set out to do, but I feel like I have to accept the fact that to be great, I'm gonna have to sacrifice. 
I'm gonna have to sweat. And it's like, you don't, you don't have to do all that, but if you want to be great, it's probably not gonna be a walk in the park. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's not a surprise to most people, but it was a surprise to me. I'm not gonna lie. But yeah, I mean, it even like, when I think about my, my past life, when I, <laughs> when I wanted to be a singer and I really wanted that to be my career path and I and I wanted to win Grammys I don't think I ever thought it would be hard because I loved singing and I wasn't particularly bad at it I have a mixtape coming out by the way but yeah I didn't I didn't think I'd be bad at it like I thought it'd be easy to win a Grammy but in retrospect like you know it's probably never easy to win a Grammy even if even if you're super talented and you love music and it comes easy to you and you're just a natural, you know, talent or whatever, it's probably not easy to be great. Like Beyonce, right? I, I know I'm a stan, I'm a bumblebee, whatever. But like, <laughs> I'm sure that even though Beyonce is a naturally great singer and she probably loves what she does, I'm, I don't know, but I think she loves what she does. It's still probably not easy to be great. Like Lemonade probably was not just easy to come out with. You know what I mean? Or even, what was the album? Like the Beyonce album, I don't think that was, I forget her prior album, but like the Beyonce album or the B-Day, I love the B-Day album. That probably wasn't just a walk in the park to make, you know, it probably, it probably took a lot of blood, sweat and tears, a lot of feeling like, can I be great? You know, I don't know that I just assume. Um, but regardless, regardless of how it is for other people, I don't, I don't really care about how things work for other people because I'm not them. For me, I can say that I, I really haven't been challenged in this life and I had to face the fact that in order to be great, I will have to challenge myself. I will have to be challenged. Otherwise, can I really call it being great? I don't know. I don't know. Would it feel worth it? I don't know. Uh, sorry, last thing, last thing. I remember, <laughs> I remember um, watching this video. Was it? Yes, yes, yes. I was watching Malcolm Gladwell give a talk at Google. And I think he was talking about his book, The Outliers. And he was talking about how there are certain countries in Asia that consistently have the highest math scores for standardized tests, either math scores or IQ, in some standardized tests across the world. Like there are certain tests that I think everyone in the world takes so that they can rank countries by like how their kids score. And certain countries in Asia, or I guess certain kids in Asia constantly score highest in the world. And he decided to like figure out why that was the case. And he realized that when he talked to American kids, a lot of American kids feel like, you know, you have to, the people who are good at math were just born good at math. Like they just naturally are talented at it. And I see that a lot. You know, there's so many people who are like, oh, I suck at math. It's like math is not something you really suck at. It's something you practice. Like it's not, it's, it's not something you're good or bad at. It's literally just something you do through repetition and then you get it. Like, I don't I don't know, same with chemistry. It's not something you're good or bad at, it's something you practice. But he found that when he would interview students from those countries in Asia, they all had more of a growth mindset. They all felt like in order to do well in school, you have to work hard. And that was something that they valued. They didn't value being naturally good. And a lot of psychological studies have been done on this where like you, you give two groups of people some puzzles, you tell one group, usually they do this with kids, you tell one group that in order to be good at something, you have to be naturally good at it. Then you tell another group that like in order to be good at something, you have to work hard. And the people who were told that you have to work hard were more likely to finish the puzzle. Whereas the people who were told you have to be naturally good, they felt like the puzzle was stupid and they didn't work as hard. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. I, I think I have really been used to being good at, you know, science courses and like all the things I needed to do to get to where I am today. And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that, but I'm just, I'm just learning and waking up to the fact that like, it's good to be challenged. If you wanna be great, it's good to be challenged. Even when you feel like it's breaking you down, it's good to be challenged. <laughs> all right, all right, that's all I have. So like if you wanna like, share if you wanna share, comment if you wanna comment. I have an email address, mdphdnme at gmail.com. I think I have a Facebook group. <laughs> Even my personal Facebook, like I am not on there. Like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like, 
<laughs> Facebook, I haven't been on Facebook for years, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I don't think there's anything else we have to do. Bye. <laughs> also, also, here's the like portrait situation that I was like, that I did that video about. I don't know if this, I don't know if this video is gonna come soon, but like the video where I explain like what this means to me. Um, but yeah, I don't know which one's gonna come out first, but like, yeah. Okay, bye. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sorry.